talking about chapter 30, section 5. And it's all about the end of the war and its legacy. So President Nixon, um, when he was elected president, uh, used a policy that he called Vietnamization, which is basically a gradual withdrawal of American troops. And he is responsible for helping to bring to an end the longest war in America's history. Well, at least until the Iraq War. Uh, Iraq and Afghanistan are now the longest wars in America's history. I want to start with this picture. Um, it's a famous photograph of a South Vietnamese soldier, the man with the gun, about to kill a South Vietnamese civilian who was allegedly a member of the Viet Cong. And it's a disturbing image, but I hope this brings to home you know, some of the problems that we're talking about. So, as President Richard Nixon found that negotiations were ineffective, North Vietnam was not going to rest until they have reunited with South Vietnam. The Viet Cong were not going to stop until they have reunited with North Vietnam, until the entire former country of Vietnam was communist. Meanwhile, uh, the National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger, was working on a new plan. He called it Vietnamization. The fact that this war could go on forever. We could very likely still be involved in this war. But that's obviously not what the American people want. And we need to get out of there. We need to help the Army of the Republic of South Vietnam become sustainable become independent. So that's the end goal. Nixon called this peace with honor. That we could potentially be done with the Vietnam conflict, but that we could also achieve our objectives. So how are we going to do this? Well, number one, you know, one of the chief problems handicapping the U.S. military is that no matter how many supply bases we raided, no, many, no matter how many resources we deprived the Viet Cong of, they continued to have more. And they could potentially have a limitless supply of resources. Why? Because China and the Soviet Union are going to continue providing them. Why? Because they have a vested interest in seeing a communist country defeat the United States. And these countries were willing to continue to invest indefinitely. So how are we going to stop that? Well, the problem is that supply line is going right through Laos and Cambodia, two neighboring countries. Okay, major highway. I mean, you could see it from a satellite. Okay, there's the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Here's all the guns that are going to be shooting and killing American soldiers. There they are. By the way, major highway going right through Laos, Cambodia. What are we going to do about it? Uh, there's nothing we can do about it because they're different countries. Are you kidding? So what did Nixon do? Well, he bombed the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which just so happened to be in Laos and Cambodia. Unrest at home. Unrest at home continued. Vietnam was the chief issue student demonstrations were increasing. After careful consideration with my senior civilian and military advisors and in full consultation with the government of Vietnam, I have decided to reduce the authorized troop ceiling in Vietnam to 484,000 by December 15th. The first troops that returned from Vietnam were greeted by family and friends as they arrived in Seattle, Washington. In mid-December, President Nixon said 50,000 more troops would be withdrawn by April 15th of next year. This brought the total amount of troop withdrawal to 115,000 men. 
so the gradual withdrawal of U.S. troops. Nixon also claimed that the majority of Americans supported the policies of the United States in our war with Vietnam. He called it the silent majority. He said, look, you know, the hippies, the protests are simply a, vo a vocal minority. And so to prove this, he said, look, if you support the president and our policies in fighting communism in Vietnam, write a letter. That's all I ask. Write a letter to the White House. So he got less than 10,000 letters. But guess what? He put them all over the cameras. He showed the stacks of letters. He was like, look at all these people that support us. All you crazy hippies, you're the minority. He said, and I quote, opposition to the war in Vietnam is the single greatest threat to the United States. So he's not the only one who hated critics. Meanwhile, in 1969, Lieutenant William Cayley of the United States Army ordered his platoon to burn down an entire village of South Vietnamese people, killing 108 innocent men, women, and children because he alleged they were members and supporters of the Viet Cong. Now he was arrested. Along with his platoon, he was put on trial, and he was convicted and sent to prison. The United States Army disavowed any connection with Lieutenant William Cayley and said, we did not order this. We did not endorse this. We certainly do not support these actions. But the damage was done. American soldiers have now been proven to have murdered innocent women and children. Can we really call ourselves the good guys? Now, most involved in this conflict had nothing to do with this. The vast majority of people had nothing to do with this. But that's not how politics work. People judge groups based on isolated incidents. It's unfortunate, but that's reality. And so many people started calling it. It's unfortunate. Many people started calling uh, veterans of this war baby killers. Now, in 1970, American troops invaded Cambodia. So now we've gone further than bombing Laos and Cambodia. We're now raiding them. From a military standpoint, this was a very effective operation. We closed down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It's embarrassing. You could see this thing from outer space. Oh, yeah, there's the planes, there's the tanks, there's the jeeps. They're coming right in. So we stopped it. Very effective. Again, from a military standpoint, effective from a political standpoint, this led to one and a half million college students leaving their campuses. This led to the largest student walkout in American history. So I like showing this. You see, once more, just like the Nuremberg trials, Kelly's, Kelly's platoon claimed they were just doing their job, just following orders. But Callie's crime reminded us <coughs> that no matter what, we are responsible for our actions. And just because you are ordered to do a bad thing does not excuse you from it. Which leads us to Kent State University. One of these student demonstrations took place at Kent State in Ohio. And a group of students were staging a nonviolent demonstration in the main square on campus. They had been there for several days. The president of the university called upon the mayor of the town to do something and the mayor called the National Guard. 
most of these National Guardsmen were reservist, um, about your age, uh, you know, attending school while going to trainings one weekend a month, uh, a couple weeks a year. Um, these, these are young people. And I'm about to show you footage from this. They were called out to disperse the demonstrators. And to this day, no one has claimed giving an order to fire on the crowd. In fact, as a result of this incident, riot control officers are given non-lethal ammunition, rubber bullets. But in this case, they were given full metal jacket, lethal ammunition. Four students were killed by the U.S. National Guard at Kent State University. Two more at Jackson State. This led to massive demonstrations. Okay, so when Nixon invaded Cambodia, again, from a military standpoint, makes perfect sense. Politically, however, this was a last straw. Congress actually repealed the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, taking away the president's broad executive powers in the war. Meanwhile, the Pentagon Papers were published, showing that it wasn't a result of the Tonkin Gulf incident that, oh no, now we have to do something. We had been planning involvement in Vietnam for many years prior. So was the government lying about our intentions in Vietnam? Well, the Pentagon Papers sadly proved, yes, they were absolutely lying about their intentions in Vietnam. And so by 1971, 60% of Americans felt that we should withdraw from Vietnam by the end of the year. 1972, the North Vietnamese attacked again. The United States responded by bombing cities again. But yet the National Security Advisor finally agreed to a complete withdrawal of American forces, declaring that, quote, peace is at hand. The goal was this peace with honor that Nixon had been hoping for. But South Vietnam rejected this plan of two separate Vietnams. As talks broke off, we resumed bombing. Eventually, Congress removed the president's authority to be involved in the Vietnam War at all with the passage of the War Powers Act, called for an end to the war, and signed peace in 1973. The initial agreement was that we would fully withdraw on the condition that there would be two separate Vietnams along the DMZ, there would be a division. That lasted for two years. And by 1975, Saigon fell and the South was invaded. And here's the fall of Saigon in 1975. The city of Saigon was renamed today. The victorious communists who forced the city's surrender said the capital of South Vietnam henceforth will be known as Ho Chi Minh City. <laughs> North Vietnamese and Viet Cong troops rolled into the city to the cheers of some Saigonese, but not to all. One South Vietnamese army colonel committed suicide with his pistol in a downtown square. 
The Viet Cong headquarters was set up in the former presidential palace, and the former president, Zong Van Min, is in custody. The American embassy was sacked, burned, and looted. A North Vietnamese tank broke the gate at the president's palace in Saigon. A communist soldier ran the revolution's flag across the empty lawn. The shooting on this day the communists won was not in a battle, but a celebration. Saigon had already surrendered. The people here were herded into groups. All they could take was hand luggage. Fifty at a time, they took off for the carriers waiting in the South China Sea. We are profoundly grateful to our Commander-in-Chief and to our nation for this day. God bless America. God bless America. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for So the legacy of Vietnam. 58,000 Americans lost their lives in this country. Many more would die later from long-term exposure to Agent Orange and other dangerous chemicals. By the end of the war, well over two million North and South Vietnamese had perished in this conflict. And returning veterans faced indifference and hostility at home. Many, of course, developed post-traumatic stress syndrome. About 15% were formally diagnosed. Many more went undiagnosed. The response to this was the rise of communism in Southeast Asia. Around 400,000 South Vietnamese were placed into labor camps. About one and a half million South Vietnamese fled the country becoming refugees. The United States accepted a great many of those. Civil war broke out in Cambodia. The Khmer Rouge regime seized power, declared communism in Cambodia. The leader of this movement was a man named Pol Pot. He is actually the third leading mass murderer in all of human history. Sometime you should read about the killing fields in Cambodia. The child armies that he raised. You know, it's actually given us interesting studies of child cognitive development that he used children as his most brutal soldiers. As far as the legacy of Vietnam, the draft was abolished. It has not since been used. Of course, the War Powers Act was passed, limiting the president's power to wage war. Congress must be notified of troops in any country within 48 hours. Congress must approve of these actions within 90 days. But nonetheless, the political damage was done. An increasing number of Americans felt cynical about our government in general, a distrust of our political leaders. And those feelings have not quite gone away. 